notes so I wouldn't ramble or speak too long. Being love, Reverend Pridgen, members of the Candler community, friends and guests, and to all who have been concerned about this luncheon, I am not standing here by myself. I am able to stand here because of my family. Thank you, Will, Ryan, Mom. Thank you, beloved cousins and sister cousins. I'm able to stand here because of the foundation for ministry given to me by Candler School of Theology. I'm able to stand here because I have been given meaningful work to do, and I have had wise and wonderful women working with me. I'm able to stand here because I have supportive, encouraging friends who continue to challenge me to expand my thinking, one of whom drove a long distance two days ago to give me something to bring with me for this occasion. So I'm going to claim my friend's gift of support, and I'm going to wear it while I speak with you. I'm short, so I have to push it back. <laughs> I also stand here because God is very good and seems to enjoy surprising me. <laughs> I am surprised to be here, and surprise seems to be a theme in my life. When I was a fairly new college graduate in the late 1960s, and y'all remember the headlines of those days, every new headline brought us something to shake our heads about. I went to lament the craziness of life to my former faculty advisor. He was a, Co a Candler graduate and my religion professor at Columbia College, which is a United Methodist Women's College in South Carolina. As I poured out my heart and my questions, he said to me, sounds to me like you should go to seminary. That was his answer to my overflowing bucket of questions about why and how and when and how come. And I just laughed at him. That was the most unexpected thing he could have said. It surprised me, and I told him. He said, at Candler, I would likely find some folks who were asking some of the same questions, so it was the strength of my disquieting and uncomfortable questions that brought me here. I did not understand it to be a call to ministry. My full-time job was flying around on Delta Airlines DCH to San Francisco and New York and Jamaica. I was not looking for a job. <laughs> I was looking for answers. First year at Candler, even on that first day, I brought my questions with me up the steps of Bishop's Hall. And right away, there were more questions piled on, more surprise. Because as I moved from class to class, I noticed that I was consistently the only woman in the class. I understand that's different now. <laughs> if I wanted to talk to another female, I had to go down to the office and find Helen Stout. <laughs> right. Hundreds and hundreds of men, and me. And that surprised me. I simply had not considered that possibility. It had not entered my imagination, and I decided it was just divine compensation going to a girls' school. <laughs> <laughs> I really had not considered any gender issues, but I began to, mm -hmm. because it was so obvious that something was out of balance. Mm -hmm. It seemed strange and was surprising to me that I would be the only woman there. Mm -hmm. Who worked that out? Why? And my second year at Candler in 1970 brought some more surprises. Thankfully, that year some more women showed up, and I was never so glad to see anybody in my life. Finally, I would have company in that huge women's lounge in the lobby of Bishop's Hall. <laughs> that second year was also the year of systematic theology. I wasn't exactly sure what that was going to be, but I was hoping it was the class where I could begin to untangle and find some answers to the questions that were churning in my brain. The first several days in that class, listening to Ted Runyon, that, those were interesting, and it surprised me that I reacted so strongly to what he said. 
he kept talking about something called the doctrine of man. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered when he was going to get around to discussing me <laughs> and the doctrine of woman. But he never did. It began to dawn on me that something was terribly wrong here, too. And an idea began to take hold. One day, when I was down in Emory Village shopping at the Kroger, it's now the CDS, but in 1970, that was Kroger, I impulsively bought a bag of apples, red apples. And I took them to class with me, and I shared them with the other women. At that point, I was not brave enough to be too disruptive, but I did want to demonstrate to him what I was hearing, and so did the other women. At that point, whenever Ted would begin to speak and use exclusive language, I just picked up the apple that was sitting on the corner of my desk. <laughs> as juicy and loud as I could make it. And he looked a little bit puzzled. And then some apples rolled down the aisle like a bowling ball and hit the lectern with a thud and just lay there. Some of the men in the class were annoyed and surprised at what we did. But I was surprised to find that that was very important to me. Dr. Runyon was gracious to discuss our concerns. I think it is a hallmark of confident intellect that one is willing to talk with people who disagree with you. Yes. So the women in the class and Dr. Runyon taught each other all year long. My third year at Candler was also a surprise. Classmates were beginning to plan for what they were going to do next after graduation. Well, I had not considered two words in the English language side by side before. My ministry just had not occurred. What was I supposed to do with this education? I had come for answers, and they were few and far between. I decided to take a few, a bit fewer classes and stretch out my time here because I had another question to deal with. Was I called to ministry? And if so, what in the world would it look like? In my fourth and last year, I worked on responses to the committee who had examined me before graduation. I told them I had come to seminary to find some answers, and they said, well, did you? I told them I learned a lot of facts, a lot of helpful insights, but mostly I had learned to ask better questions. Mm -hmm. My ministry would be with those who are struggling with questions themselves and do not need someone to give them an easy, empty rhetoric for answer, although it might be temporarily you know, comforting. I have come to believe that it is not necessary to have a long list of answers to be faithful. In fact, it has been my experience that those who cling to a long string of absolutes are not only unpleasant to be around, but they may act confident, but I find them to be among the most fearful people in the church. For the past 40 years, I have been in ministry in the company of those for whom life was confusing and complicated, <clears throat> and some of them have not handled it very well. Some of those have asked the hardest questions there are to ask. Women in prison for crimes, or because they fell in love with a jerk who committed a crime. Women addicted to street drugs or sophisticated prescriptions they get from pharmacies who have sold their bodies, their mama's silver, and their own children to the pusher. Women who have broken bones and cigarette burns all over their bodies put there by the one who promised to love and cherish until death. Women who have been given diagnoses of bipolar or inadequate personality, suicidal affective disorder, schizophrenia, and depression. Women who never had a birthday cake because no one ever celebrated their being born. Women who've been looking for love in all the wrong places and finding betrayal and manipulation, and then they learned that very well. Battered women, shattered women, incest survivors, rape victims, women who would like to be able to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. But they don't know the song, and they don't know the love, because no one ever told them. No one was ever loving. I am at home with those who ask questions, and it has been my deep privilege to stand with them in some of the most intense moments of redemption and reconciliation as guideposts 
to better questions and possible answers. My ministry, which I've learned to put together comfortably, has been God's gift to me. I invite you to look online at killingsworth.org. I can't go home without saying that. <laughs> to find out more about the amazing women of Killingsworth and how God is powerfully at work in their lives, surprising them at every turn with grace and forgiveness and joy. And for this lovely gift of acknowledgement that you give me today, I thank you. I know that it is not for what I have done. I do nothing without those who have been standing with me, undergirded by a holy energy and a fierce desire to be part of the journey toward love and justice. My real reward is to be surprised again and again by the mystery of seeing glimpses of the kingdom as lives are transformed. This honor you give me, it honors my ministry, not me. And as I said, claiming that I had a ministry of my own was a struggle and a journey in itself. It's that way for many folks. If one is honest, being beckoned by the creator of the universe is about as big a surprise as one could get. Mm -hmm. Who can imagine it? God wants me to do what? <laughs> it makes me laugh. It tells me something about the nature of God. It surprises me that I am included in a holy beckoning to come dance. Candler didn't do that. God did that. Yes. Being at Candler helped me accept that. Yes. You know there were people who said I shouldn't. <laughs> there were people who threw scripture at me, taken out of context, mm -hmm. to support their fear. Mm -hmm. There were those who said I was an abomination. Wow. Mm -hmm. There was the woman who followed me into the women's lounge at Bishop's Hall and told me that I was going to hell for being a candler and for going into ministry. They told other women that too. There were people who bit the hand of the first woman who served them communion. There were those who changed the locks on the doors of the parsonage in the church before yes. their first woman preacher arrived. Yes. There were those who were convinced they were reading scripture correctly and they had a list of rules and a book of discipline to refer to. <laughs> and they told me and other women that it just wasn't right. That I clearly had not understood God correctly. And if I thought I was called of God, then, since there wasn't anything wrong with them, there must be something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. God said, <coughs> hang tight. Mm -hmm. Fear not. Yes. One day you might even get a distinguished award from me. <laughs> God will love who God will love. Just like we. God will call whom God will call. Amen. And the truth is, God calls each one of us to some kind of loving response to life. And we must not, we <coughs> dare not declare to anyone that they may not follow that fierce leading, the one that they feel in their own hearts. For those who discourage such a leading, well, there's something about Millstone. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so from this place that I am standing today, I encourage those who stand now where I stood 40 plus years ago. To those who are totally surprised that God wants to use their passion and their strength to share good news, even while others tell them loudly by their actions that they are not worthy to do that. Mm -hmm. Take heart. Scripture records a number of things that did not seem right to those trying to discern the will of God as they wrote. And in our time, some folks latch on to one or two of those things and make life miserable for many people struggling to be faithful. Sometimes they make it dangerous. To those who have tattoos, to those who have shaved their faces, to those who love someone that is not on the approved church list, mm -hmm. to those who wear clothes of mixed cloth, mm -hmm. to those who have eaten shellfish or pork, to those wearing gold jewelry, to all those who have participated in what some verse somewhere in Scripture defines as an abomination, take heart. And especially to those, <clears throat> to those who are surprised, upset, or even shocked by whom God has apparently called and clearly wants to do the work, 
Get over it. <laughs> it's not ours to decide. That belongs to God. Yeah. And especially to those who are surprised, upset, or even shocked by whom God has apparently called. Get over it. Yeah. What was written in Scripture long ago, God is trying through our struggles together to clarify for us because some writers then and some interpreters today somehow over missed the overwhelming message of love and acceptance that stands beside the call yes. to justice and righteousness. Yes. There was a New Testament. There was an announcement of good news. If a woman with long straight hair flowing down her back past her waist, who spends her weekends flying to San Francisco or New York wearing gold jewelry, if she believes that she is called to ministry and over and over and over again God confirms it, and now Candler does too, <laughs> then hear this good news. Weeping may last for a night, mm. but joy does come in the morning. You are welcomed with your tattoos and your wool blend jackets and your heretofore unorthodox lovers and your shrimp cocktails and your clean shaven faces or your beard. <laughs> it's your choice. God has a place and a work for you. And someday the church will see it together. I yes. pray sooner than later. Yes. The church saw it coming and now celebrates the good news of the ministry of my clergy sisters, regardless of what St. Paul and the Desert Fathers wrote. God made a place for us. Open hearts. Open minds. Open doors? Those are questions, not just statements. I look forward to the day when the church catches up with the breathtaking love and grace and of God and practices the good news that it preaches. Thank you so much for this. It will carry me a long way. Amen.